reading essential elements of fairness, the fundamentals of fair play into our Constitution. But what some call fair, others called unfair. And Earl Warren would become one of the most revered and reviled men of the 20th century. We say that Earl Warren has done those things which unfortunately have usurped the Constitution. It was an activist court. That is, it held things unconstitutional that weren't. The legacy, I'm afraid, is a bit of lawlessness in the courts. The Warren court had uh, plenty of critics. There was no shortage of them. I still get this one drunk farmer that calls me here in St. Helena to this day and says, I hate you and I hate your grandfather. I've always hated your grandfather. He calls at midnight and it just goes on. This is happening now in 1988. And how did Earl Warren react to his critics? He said, everything that I did in my life that was worthwhile, I caught help for. I can't imagine anyone who conducted the, uh, himself in, as Chief Justice more effectively or uh, better than did Earl Warren. And I called him Super Chief because he was a Super Chief. Convention Hall, Philadelphia, 1948. Republicans are choosing their man to go up against the feisty Democratic president, Harry Truman. One of the contenders is California's popular governor, Earl Warren. With his almost picture-perfect family and national reputation and skillful use of the press, some said Earl Warren was on his way to the White House. Earl Warren genuinely wanted to be president of the United States. And all of us who were his friends and supporters agreed that he would make a great president of the United States. And Earl Warren said, I think I have a chance, but I'm not sure. But I will promise you one thing. I will not accept the vice presidency. That is outside of all of my thinking. It's absolutely impossible. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I know what it feels like to get hit by a streetcar. <laughs> and before I forget it, and before you change your mind, I want to say that I accept the nomination. Many people said if Warren had been the candidate, the Republicans would have won. But he wasn't, and they didn't. In a stunning upset, the Dewey Warren ticket was defeated by Mr. Truman. To reporters asking what had happened, Warren explained, Mr. Truman just got too many votes. It was a classic Warren comment. Whatever his private feelings, publicly there were no regrets, no accusations, and no slowing down. And in 1952, he had his eye on the presidency again. We're here for a serious purpose, and we want to do what we can to bring the Republican administration to Washington next January. But America's favorite war hero, Dwight Eisenhower, decided that he wanted to be president. They met as rivals on the convention floor. There was a hard-fought battle, a private meeting, a crucial vote, and suddenly, Ike had a new supporter. Exactly how or why it all happened would later be a matter of some dispute. But so far as we know, it was in return for Warren's support here at the convention that Eisenhower promised Warren the first vacancy on the Supreme Court. The difficult thing was that the first vacancy, nobody expected it, was in the Chief Justiceship. He he'd had a commitment from Ike uh, to have uh, the first opening on the Supreme Court, that, those were the exact words. And then suddenly uh, the Chief Justice died, 
and uh, that was Fred Vinson, Chief Justice Vinson, who died very unexpectedly. And I went out and met Governor Warren. He had just come in from a hunting trip. The question then was, did he think that this offer included an offer of the Chief Justiceship, which, of course, the President had never had in mind. They tried to persuade him to allow someone else to be appointed to Vincent's place and for him to take the Associate Justice spot, and he said the exact words were the first opening, period, and he held to it. President Eisenhower appoints Governor Earl Warren of California as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Governor of his state for 10 years, Earl Warren will be the second Republican on the Supreme Court. He will preside over a tribunal which is faced with history-making decisions. No event in Earl Warren's past could equal what now awaited him. The NAACP had challenged segregated public schools in a case called Brown versus Board of Education. But much more than education was at stake. Warren and his brethren were being asked to judge segregation in America. For a year before Warren's appointment, the court had postponed deciding the Brown case. Four justices were prepared to overturn segregation. Three planned to uphold it. Two wanted to overturn it, but did not believe it legally possible. They were divided and deadlocked. When Earl Warren came to the court, he came to a disorganized court, a cowardly court. They could see they couldn't agree upon important problems in civil rights. And they were not only divided on ideological, philosophical lines, but there was bit of personal antagonism between the two wing wings of the court. My brother-in-law, Justice Block, was on the Supreme Court, and uh, it was a tremendous event when Justice Warren came. But there was tremendous fear and hope about him. Was he going to be on the liberal side of the court? Uh, was he going to be more or less a uh, conservative? He was appointed, as you know, by Eisenhower, and we thought he was Republican. But NAACP Chief Counsel Thurgood Marshall, who would argue Brown versus Board of Education and later become America's first black justice, got an early clue about the new man on the court from a black Supreme Court laborer. He said, this new Chief Justice. I said, yeah, I said, you know him. I said, I know about him. And he said, uh, well, what about him? Are you guys going to fight him? I said, no. As a matter of fact, we're going to support him. Why? He says, well, I can tell you a little story. Yesterday, he came down this hall just like you. And when I saw him approaching, I did what I supposed to be. I got out of his way, backed off, and he came over to me and put his hand out, and he says, and what's your name? And I told him what my name was. He says, well, my name is Warren, and shook my hand. And he says, when you do that to a laborer, all I'm telling you is, you fight him and I'll kill you. It's amazing. It's amazing how the Lord The Supreme Court had declared in 1896 that separate but equal was the law of the land. And for half a century, separate was the reality and equal a cruel deception. Slowly and painfully, in case after case, the NAACP had been whittling away at the doctrine. But to overturn separate but equal meant striking down a precedent, something the Supreme Court very rarely did until Earl Warren arrived in the October term of 1953. He was always, even with me, very circumspect in talking about cases that were before the court. But I do remember one time out in the duck blind where absolutely nobody could <laughs> hear us. I remember bringing up Brown versus Board of Education, and this is all he said. He says, Earl, he says, I just want to tell you this. You know how I feel about these things. But he says, I also want to tell you, I do not know yet what the Constitution will permit me to do. When Warren came and the case came up for discussion in their private conference, Warren immediately said, it seems to me that the only way we can uphold segregation is if we believe in the inferiority of the Negro. 
And that put all those who approved of segregation in the law on the defensive. Warren believed that segregation violated constitutional guarantees of equal protection and that the decision against it must be unanimous. Warren, for political reasons, said uh, this decision will be so controversial, we don't want to give the opponents the ammunition of saying that some justices dissented. December 1953, first conference on the Brown case. No decision issued. And remember, he had come from the world of politics. He realized the whole world was going to be against him, so at least he had to have his court with him. February 1954, first vote. No decision issued. He, no more than any other justice, has control over what the other justices feel and do, and there were some very, very strong minds and feelings on the court at the time. April 1954, Warren drafts the majority opinion. No decision issued. When Warren came, you know, as governor, he could just bark a command and it would be done. As chief justice, he could only persuade Early May 1954, Warren meets privately with a dissenting justice. No decision issued. That was a tough one. Everybody was betting about it. You know, some said it was going to be seven to two. It all kind of bets. I was the only one that didn't bet. I said, I'll take five to four. It don't matter. Just so I win it. That's all I wanted. So that's a darn important case. <laughs> There were signs that Monday, May 17, 1954, would not be a normal day at the Supreme Court. Justice Jackson, frail from a serious heart attack, left his hospital bed to join his brethren on the bench. Justice Clark told his clerks, I think you boys ought to be in the courtroom today. At one in the afternoon, Earl Warren began to read aloud the words he had written himself the decision of the Supreme Court. Does the segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of a minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does. We conclude unanimously that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. In her segregated high school classroom in Washington, D.C., the young Eleanor Holmes Norton first heard the decision. The bell rang and, and, and as if to make an announcement, uh, as, as is the case in high schools often. And uh, the principal, Mr. Lofton, came on to the public address system. And there he was to tell us that the Supreme Court had declared the schools in which we were sitting unconstitutional, which is to say that they would soon be integrated schools. Well, this to us was unbelievable. Teachers that just broke down and cried. It was a historic and memorable day. There was no institution in the United States willing to do that except the court and while we now all embrace the decision let me remind you that the Warren court was a pariah after that decision and not alone in the south but often throughout the north shockwaves of rage and delight convulsed the nation with one decision the supreme court unelected and unaccountable to the public had restructured american society Many called it the most important decision of the Warren court. Earl Warren, Jr. disagreed. People say, well, what, what's your father's greatest decision? You know, and then they'll, they'll pick up Brown versus Board of Education or something like that. Uh, but that's not right. His, his greatest decision was to, to, to marry my mother.
mean, he just so I happened to see her at a public plunge and, and said to one of his buddies, who is that? I want to meet her. But he set his sights on her and that was it. They spent a unique honeymoon in British Columbia watching a courtroom trial. Earl and Nina wanted a large family, but large families are expensive and the Warrens were never wealthy. Concern over money, coupled with a strict sense of values, lasted throughout Warren's lifetime. The financial worries he kept to himself, the values he passed on to his children. My father had very deep-seated principles which he just felt were inflexible. In other words, fairness. The, 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 the basic concepts upon which you operate. And those apparently were instilled in my father by, I think primarily by my grandfather at a very, very early age. Warren's vision of society was shaped by the two distinct worlds of his childhood, his very poor moralistic family and the rowdy oil boom town of Bakersfield where they lived. There was no moral middle ground. There never would be for Earl Warren. His father had worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad, and Warren worked also summers as a so-called call boy. His job was to gather the men to work on the railroad. And he said he saw these men, and he saw how they were wasted on the job, human wastage. And he told his clerks and others later on that for the first time in his life, he realized what it meant to be a worker in a day when there was no social insurance of any kind, no protection for unemployment, no old age pensions, nothing. Once they were used up, the railroad discarded them, he said, and they had nothing. The things I learned about monopolistic power, political dominance, corruption in government, and their effect on the people of the community were valuable lessons that would tend to shape my career throughout life although I did not then foresee any such results. Nor did he foresee a lifelong commitment to the law, which deepened and strengthened as he moved from district attorney to state attorney general to governor to chief justice of the United States. He was not a do-gooder. He didn't go out and say, hey, let's do good for all these people. His bent was, what we can do is make the law correct. And if the law is correct, they will be able to get an education. So his trend wasn't towards do good, and his trend was using the law to be equal. But he felt it would work if they could vote, if they could go to school, if they could get jobs. It would all come together, and the American dream would be taken care of. With the Brown decision, the American dream finally seemed within reach for black Americans. Now they had the law on their side. In Arkansas, the Little Rock School Board became the first in the South to announce its intention to comply with the court's desegregation order. The school board wanted to comply with the law as set down by the Supreme Court. But the general public was against it. And then Faubus, uh, Governor Faubus, uh, who had great leadership in this state and a great following, uh, was opposed to it. The original Supreme Court decision is illegal and violates the principles of democracy. And our school system was in between two almost irresistible forces. The Supreme Court on one side and the strong, rabid segregationists led by Mr. Faubus on the other. In the great problem now facing our nation because of the unwarranted assumption of illegal power by branches of the federal government, I shall continue without wavering to defend the right of a state to conduct its own affairs. Mr. Faubus was telling the people that the Supreme Court decision was not the law of the land. Well, every lawyer knew that it was the law of the land, but non-lawyers did not know that. You see, there are many people who, who were integrationists who were on my side because they said it's, it's done improperly. We should do it through a law of the Congress, our constitutional amendment. 
that the court doesn't have the right to make the law. The role of the court had been brought into question, a question that remains today. The framers of the Constitution understood correctly that the greatest protection of human freedom and liberty was local autonomy, government close to the people. That's what federalism is all about. States having power and Supreme Court decision making is contrary to the federalism arrangement. Look, let's face it, the Warren Court did the country a favor. There was nobody with the guts to say that segregation was wrong as a matter of law. No president had the guts. Nobody in Congress had the guts, north or south. Uh, nobody uh, in the states, those states who were concerned, had the guts. Here was the court. The court, under our Constitution, is responsible to no one but the law and the Constitution. So, so the court could, if it had the guts, say it. The court had only said segregation was illegal in public schools, but the implication was clear. A way of life that many white Americans took comfort in and considered natural was being threatened. In anger, they rallied behind the slogan of state rights. But for nine black students from Little Rock, Arkansas, the issue was not state rights, the issue was their rights. The Little Rock Nine intended to enroll in all-white Central High School in September 1957. Governor Faubus ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school and stop them. War had been declared on integration and the authority of the Supreme Court. Little Rock would be the battlefield, and the first casualty would be one of the nine, Elizabeth Eckford. I got up that morning and got ready for school, as you, I would normally do on the first day of school. I rode the bus to within um, two blocks of the school. And walked from there to school alone. The thing that made the difference with the chief was the people. Uh, he was not indifferent to law, of course. He was, uh, he was very uh, concerned about the law, but it was people first. He couldn't help but understand who they were and what they were going through. And that came through his decisions. tried to turn into the sidewalk and the uh, National Guardsmen closed ranks. I walked a few more paces down and I an attempted to uh, turn into the school and they closed ranks with their bayonets. further and uh, a National Guardsman pointed me uh, down the street. So I thought, I, I, by that time, the mob was behind me. that they were there for my protection. I expected maybe some name calling from some of the students in the school, but that's all I expected. I couldn't turn around because they were 
right on my heels. I had to keep walking. If ever there was a time when we must be patient without being complacent, when we must be uh, understanding of other people's deep emotions as well as our own, this is it. Experience Within three weeks, Little Rock had become an international embarrassment for America. But I have never the president announced our enemies are gloating over this incident and using it to misrepresent our whole nation. Reluctantly, he ordered over 1,000 troops of the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock to enforce the court decision and protect the nine students. <laughs> Today, this central high school playing field is only one of many settings for America's unfinished struggle toward integration and equality. But in 1957, the entire nation watched as federal troops escorted the Little Rock Nine to and from classes throughout the school year. And even troops could not protect them from daily taunts, threats, and violence. When school let out, Governor Faubus was re-elected in a landslide victory. Triumphantly, he made plans for a new legal strategy to preserve segregation. The states had in their power a simple, perfectly legal way to make the Brown decision not only ineffective, but harmful to blacks. And that was simply abolish the free public school systems, which they were threatening to do the federal courts have said only that an agency of the state cannot maintain segregated schools. Governor Faubus announced the closing of all public schools in Little Rock and suggested that private, segregated institutions lease the empty school buildings. you'd rather have the schools closed than open on an integrated basis. Yes, sir, I do. How do you feel about that? Well, I sort of feel the same way Larry does. I, I wouldn't mind going to school with them, but if you go to school with them, then they're going to start coming to our dances and things like that, and I wouldn't want that. I see. How do you feel? I definitely do not want to go to school with integrated classes, and I think... You don't want to go to an integrated no, school sir, at all? No, sir, I do not, and I'd much rather school be closed. Governor, are you aware that the Presbytery of Washburn today is considering a resolution calling upon you to open school? I would not be surprised at that. I'm aware that a large number of the ministers in the Presbyterian Church have been very effectively brainwashed. You say, Governor, that ministers of the Presbyterian Church have been effectively brainwashed by whom? The left-wingers and the communists. Well, Earl Warren... Chief Justice Earl Warren did something almost unprecedented. He called the Supreme Court back into session in the summer. And one of the justices, I believe it was Judge Harlan, uh, had to come back from a European vacation. That was just almost unheard of. But they were so determined, at least Earl Warren was so determined to get this case through quickly that he made us come up there for two hearings in August which is a normal recess period in the summer for the Supreme Court. I saw Earl Warren on the bench with his backbone stiffening when he thought the dignity of the court or the Constitution were being attacked. One such occasion was in the Little Rock school case when Governor Faubus, Orville Faubus of Arkansas, took it on himself to tell the state of Arkansas that he knew better about what the Constitution commanded than the Supreme Court and the state didn't have to comply with the Supreme Court. When the lawyer made that argument in the Supreme Court, Earl Warren just bore down on him and said, I have never heard such an argument made in a court of law. And the, the lawyer, well, he had nowhere to go, but I think if he could have had the floor open and swallow him, he'd have been happy. I knew we wouldn't have Earl Warren as a vote. Uh, I knew two or three others. We, w we wouldn't have Brennan. 
as a vote. We wouldn't have William O. Douglas. I knew we had lost those. But I figured that we might get five out of the nine and get a majority that would see our side of it and, and try not to destroy our school system in Little Rock. Well, that wasn't to be. The attorney for uh, the school board stood up and started his argument with, may it please the court, the people of Little Rock. And the chief justice interrupted and said, what people are you talking about? And that was the end of the case. And now that the law has been made clear once again, it would seem to me that neither the school board of Little Rock nor the governor of Arkansas nor anyone else can find any legitimate excuse for saying they don't understand what the law is. It's crystal clear now. Brown accomplished ultimately, we're still in the middle, but ultimately Brown will have accomplished in the way of life of such an important part of the country. What in most places has been accomplished only by force of arms. Brown initiated a veritable revolution. Of course, some think it's inappropriate that a court should preside over a revolution, uh, but what was distinctive about the Warren Court was probably for the first time in our history as a country, for such a sustained period, the Supreme Court was in the vanguard. Now, the advent of Earl Warren on the court gave us a consistent period of time in which Warren could be heard moving that court to the institution of hope for the oppressed that it became. Every one of the Little Rock Nine went on to attend college. Well, Earl Warren was undoubtedly, as everybody will tell you, a wonderful man. He was undoubtedly a fine governor of California. He was undoubtedly a fine state's attorney out there. I think he was not a judge, and I think the Warren court taught people to confuse the desirability in their eyes of particular results rather than the legitimacy of the process by which the results were reached. It's as if the justices woke up in the morning or waited for somebody to bring them a case, and they asked themselves, what evil remains in the world for us to correct today? And we'll correct it. Now, you might say, well, why not? Isn't it good to have a roving moral commission? And the problem, of course, is that an institution with the political power to do good can also do wrong. It can also make decisions that are harmful. One has to say that Warren pleads guilty to having moral judgments and human judgments c color his legal opinions. But one has to believe that there's some necessary separation between law and morality to criticize Warren for that. There was no separation between law and morality for Earl Warren, and his sense of morality was rooted in fairness. And something that he asked about every single case was, is this fair? If the result wasn't fair, then he was going to see whether he couldn't find some way to make sure that it was fair. Fairness was just at the center of his view of justice. After he'd hear these beautiful arguments from uh, a counsel, would, would, would lean over and say, yes, counsel, but is it fair? <laughs> which is a totally uh, disarming question to ask a lawyer <laughs> who's, who's spouting law. But he wanted to know whether it was fair. That, to him, was the principle. Fairness was fundamental to Warren throughout his career. But fairness would be overshadowed by other concerns in the early 1940s. Japan's sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, World War II had arrived on American shores. Up and down the West Coast, an anxious public asked, are we next? As head of California's civil defense, Attorney General Warren insisted on the removal of Japanese Americans to internment camps. Fear and rumors had fueled widespread hostility to Asians. Amid air raid sirens and blackout drills, Warren and many others had concluded that the enemy was already here. He believed the Japanese were a threat. He believed the Japanese were hard to figure out, inscrutable, all the stereotypes. He said, I can't tell a saboteur from a Jap. 
racism in California was rampant in those times. There was a whole fear of the Japanese coming through. Even though, as everybody knows now, there were no cases of espionage or disloyalty by any of these 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry. It was very just difficult for people. Here we were, American citizens, and we were accused by our own government of being disloyal to our own country. I can't think of anything worse than to be disloyal to your country. The evacuation order came from Washington. Suddenly forced from their homes, many Japanese Americans lost not only their possessions, but their faith in the promise of America. My father and mother uh, have described to me that uh, when the 72-hour notice was given, people would come to their homes, neighbors and others would come to their homes and say, look, you can't take that automobile, we'll give you $25 for it. Or that house of yours, uh, my dad signed the quit claim deed for $50 or so in the house and he had to just leave his produce business. My father and, and many in his age groups uh, will never be able to make up that time. I mean, my dad never went back to owning his own business again. I think emotionally he was afraid to. And my mother, when she was finally able to talk about it, she had the most difficulty talking about the internment. At one level, he felt very strongly that he was right, that this was civil defense, a war was on, these were spies and saboteurs. And his explanation was this, that he did not regret it, that at that time we were defenseless, we had no navy to defend our shores, and that the military of the nations felt that it was necessary to take all necessary protections. But at another level, in reflection, he thought, my God, I separated those people, I separated those kids from their parents. How would I feel if my kids were taken from me and put in a camp, and I was put in another camp. Some households had, had actually been put in separate centers, and the households had not been kept together. The children had gone to one relocation center, and the parents had remained in another. And Warren said that somehow he had observed some of this, and he had seen the faces of those kids when their parents left and those kids were still with him in his dreams. And he started to cry. He still remembered those faces. He wasn't a person given to admitting he was wrong, confessing error, changing his mind. And he did in the, in the Japanese relocation cases. He said straight out, I was wrong, um, I feel guilty. I have since deeply regretted the removal order and my testimony advocating it because it was not in keeping with our American concept of freedom and the rights of citizens. Whenever I thought of the little children who were torn from their home, I was conscience stricken. Children and family life were at the center of Warren's world. Though he often worked long hours, six days a week, he always found time to be with his children. Dad was one of these guys, he was always there as far as the kids were concerned. Uh, I don't think any of us ever participated in an event of any kind that was important to us, uh, that he didn't show up. He was always, always very involved. When I was 14, I don't know, 1962, my grandfather drove up specially from San Francisco to Dixon to sit in this little stands in a cow town. And he was quoted in the paper saying he's going to miss something about it because his grandson's going to play in his first school football game. Daddy would always be there. He was there for every horse show, every swim meet. He was always there for us. And the only time I saw my father sad was when he came home 
and found out that I had polio. And that was the saddest time I've ever seen him. And when Honey Bear came down with polio, some admirer, total stranger, sent her as a gift a, a, a wristwatch. And uh, Dad found out who it was. Uh, I mean, he traced it, traced it back to the store or whatever, and uh, uh, sent a very thoughtful letter back to the man and says, thanks very much. But he says, we can't accept anything like this. I remember seeing a note just the other day. This is back in the 1940s, early 1940s. He instructed his secretary to sell two shares of a, of an, a major oil company, and, and the receipt for that was $15.98. And he says, and his note was, in a hand, written in his own handwriting, I don't want to have any, even this small amount of stock in a major oil company at this time. I mean, that's how concerned he was about having everything out in the open and not having any investments where he was influenced. But he said, you know, the one thing I regret, uh, in fact, I wake up at night worrying about it. He says that I've been in public office. He never used the word politics. He says, I've been in public office for over 50 years now. And he says, you know, when you, when you work for the government, you never make any money. So he says, I've never had an opportunity to amass any kind of an estate. And as a result, I feel I have nothing to leave my children. Can you imagine the remark? The day of days for America and her allies. 1945. The war was over. The Japanese internment camps were being closed. And California's governor, Earl Warren, was presiding over a flourishing state economy. The good life was in full swing, and America was on top of the world. Accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative. By the 1950s, the awesome mushroom cloud, which had become a symbol of American power, now symbolized a threat. The Soviets had the bomb. The Rosenbergs were executed as atomic spies. And a new fear, domestic communism, settled like a shroud over the country. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover speaks with authority on the subject. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Anti-communism was not new for America, for Hoover, or for Earl Warren. As Alameda County's tough young district attorney, Warren formed his views on communists during the labor unrest of the 1930s. In neighboring San Francisco and across the nation, a crippled economy brought angry, striking workers into the streets. Warren knew that many strike organizers were communists, and to Warren, enemies of the society he was sworn to protect. One of the things Warren liked to do was anticipate where the trouble was coming. And I think he thought that a potential trouble spot in the 30s was the close relationship between potential communists and organized labor, especially in the Bay Area. So he began keeping close tabs on that. As a district attorney, he had a special office uh, that was set off to the side, and it was very, very highly secretive, and he only had three people who ever saw the inside of that room. And these people monitored not only communists, but fascists, all subversive groups. But the anti-communist prosecutor, 
would face a very different mandate years later as Chief Justice of the United States. He would admit what is right as a DA, one doesn't do as a Chief Justice. That you have to grow with every job that you're in, that you have to do things in the time and place that you are, and that that changes. Yes, one must change, he said, and uh, Earl Warren changed a lot. The function made the man. When Earl Warren came to the court in the 1950s, he found the communists and alleged communists he had once considered threats were now having their own rights threatened. In the name of national security, congressional investigative committees were steering the nation on a collision course with the Constitution. This committee, under its mandate from the House of Representatives, has the responsibility of exposing and spotlighting subversive elements wherever they may exist. For the House Un-American Activities Committee, their questions were meant to expose communists. For Earl Warren, their questions raised the issue of freedom, exactly the kinds of personal freedom the Bill of Rights was designed to protect. We're going to get the answer to that question if we have to stay here for a week. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you now? Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It is perfectly clear to me, gentlemen, that if you continue in this uh, particular Mr. Chairman, will you direct the witness to answer that question? You have only one idea, and that is to cause the price in the industry, you're excused. chaos in the industry, and the people not permit. Will you direct the witness to answer that question, Mr. Chairman, before he leaves the stand? I have not refused to answer the question. I told you before I will answer this question now, Mr. fully. Beaverman, Your purpose is to use this to disrupt, now, to invade Beaverman. the right not only of me, but of the producers to their thoughts, to their opinions. And this I will not permit. We must have order in these chambers. I thought they were crazy as bats. <laughs> I thought they were really absolutely insane. The charge against Virginia Dewar, communist subversion. Her crime, working for integration in the South. Subpoenaed and threatened with a jail term, she not only refused to testify, she enraged the committee by sitting silently and powdering her nose. I was so angry at that point and so furious. At, at that point, when you get to that mad, you don't mind if you go to jail, as long as you can say go to hell. Uh, my whole desire was to tell them to go to hell. The great question to me was when they asked me, uh, do you think a poem, man has a right to write a poem advocating the the overthrow of the United States. I said, yeah, he's got a right to write a poem about anything. And they said, anything at all? I said, yeah, anything at all. And the question of a man from Cincinnati threw up his hands and he turned to his other men on the committee and said, well, what more do we have to ask this guy? Free speech, uh, which we <laughs> revere so much now, was uh, not very uh, strongly rooted concept. Uh, when Warren came to the court. On June 17, 1957, a day that would become known as Red Monday, Earl Warren announced four decisions protecting communists, alleged communists, and the right to refuse to testify. Red Monday would infuriate Americans nationwide, including the president. After the decisions which invalidated convictions of alleged subversives. The relations between Eisenhower and Warren were purely formal. The decisions would mark a turning point in Warren's view on the competing interests of national security and free speech and tip the scales in favor of constitutional guarantees for individuals. Warren called it the right of the people to be free from unnecessary government interference. President Eisenhower, the man who appointed him, later said in life that uh, he considered the greatest mistake he ever made was the appointment of Warren to the court. Eisenhower was not alone in criticizing the court. Many members of Congress, Democrats as well as Republicans, uh, felt that the Warren court was trying to legislate rather than interpret and therefore was encroaching on the uh, constitutional prerogatives of the other two branches of the government. 
when the uh, Congress, for example, believes that it is in national interest in learning about the communist, uh, so-called communist threat to investigate these matters, it should be allowed to do so because that is the judgment of the elected representatives unless the Constitution clearly disallows it. The court held that uh, a person could not be excluded from working in a defense plant because he was a member of the Communist Party. The court held in many cases that a person could not be kept from being a teacher in public schools because he or she was a member of the Communist Party. And in my view, those decisions are unwarranted. There are so many people who believe that uh, any decision that uh, might help a man who is charged with being a communist is coddling communists. And uh, of course that is not, uh, not true. Coddling communist was exactly what many people thought Earl Warren was doing. Anti-communism had found a new scapegoat in the Chief Justice of the United States. Led by the John Birch Society, the movement to impeach Earl Warren was gaining momentum. Another Supreme Court decision would soon swell the movement's ranks. In 1961, the court ruled that state-sponsored school prayer was unconstitutional. What seemed a simple decision, upholding the separation of church and state, produced a violent reaction against Earl Warren. He had let blacks and communists into America's schools, and now he was keeping God out. I talked to him about the action of the John Birch Society, and I'd say, doesn't that aggravate you? And he said, no, it doesn't bother me a bit. He said, I know what the facts are. In his home, he had the impeacher of Warren cartoon that had been done in the New Yorker and it had Whistler's mother there embroidering an impeacher of Warren on the pillow and he had that framed on his wall so he, he had a good sense of humor about it. Warren used to joke about the billboards but I, I know Warren was, Warren was a very sensitive thin-skinned person for a politician. He told me he would drive through the south with his family on a pleasure trip and there he'd see a great big billboard saying impeacher of Warren and it made him furious and, and it hurt his feelings. Well, as simple as that. He thought, you know, he's trying to do good, and here these crazy people are saying that. But in public, any kind of semi-public setting, he would laugh it off and joke. When they struck down communist laws, they went against the grain of the majority of American thought. So I think the challenges to the court were real, and I think it was fortunate to survive as well as it did. We are, we are on, on trial, always to, and we're on trial before the, the world to see what we can do with this government of, of ours. And the better we make it, the more equal life is for people in this country, the more assuredly it will be sustained. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The inauguration of John F. Kennedy marked a dramatic about face in the strained relations between the Supreme Court and the White House. For the first time since Warren's appointment, the court had the full and unqualified support of the executive branch. A growing sense of mutual respect and friendship joined the old Chief Justice and the young President. But more than personal friendship was involved, for Kennedy would soon put the prestige of the White House behind two Warren Court decisions that critics claimed were rewriting the Constitution. They were known as one man, one vote, or reapportionment. Mr. President, would you comment on the Supreme Court reapportionment decision? I would hope that uh, equality of uh, voting, equality of representation, representation would be uh, brought about by the uh, responsible groups involved in the states, in the national government. But if no relief is forthcoming, then of course it has seemed to the administration that the judicial branch must meet a responsibility. In my mind, the most important case that we have, have had uh, in all those years was the case of Baker versus Carr, 
what we might call the parent case of the one man, one vote doctrine, which guarantees to every American citizen an equal value of his vote to that of any other vote that is cast. By mid-century, the transformation of the American public from citizen farmers to urban masses was old news, but state legislatures had failed to redistrict themselves to reflect this change. Sparsely settled rural counties around this country control the politics of the states in Florida, in Connecticut, uh, in uh, Michigan. Uh, literally, a handful of voters uh, kept control of state legislatures because those legislatures were never redistricted. Self-interest dictated against state legislators changing the system. They would lose their jobs. As case after case of inadequate representation reached the Supreme Court, Warren felt it was time for the court to act. But as he thought about the problem bef when it came before the Supreme Court, he became driven to the conclusion that there was really only one satisfactory result, and that was one person, uh, one vote. One person, one vote. That goes to the heart of our democracy. Of course, abuses of geographic representation exist in some state legislatures and should be remedied. But is this the way to do it? We say emphatically no. Clearly, it is up to the Congress to examine this whole question. Well, if you take the one man, one vote decision, I think that was a bad result. It was not called for by anything in the Constitution or anything in our history. It is, there is no reason why the people of a state cannot have, for example, a state senate uh, in which counties are represented, even as in the United States Congress, in the Senate, states are represented. Uh, but the Warren Court said no and imposed a rigid population test on the entire process. And it wasn't that in 1963, all of a sudden, the Warren Court discovered something in the Constitution that everybody had overlooked for more than 100 years. That's not so. What is so is that a majority of the Supreme Court decided to make social policy on that issue. And I sort of piped up, said, well, how could you do that? I mean, you give, you know, it ruins the state of California. And he just looked and said, you don't give votes to rocks and trees. This is Warren. Legislators represent people. Legislators represent people, not trees or acres. Legislators are elected by voters, not farms or cities. The complexions of societies and civilizations change, but the basic principle of representative government remains and must remain unchanged. The weight of a citizen's vote cannot be made to depend on where he lives. Shaken by the incomprehensible events in Dallas and heartbroken at the loss of his president, his ally, and his friend, Warren was asked to deliver a eulogy. He said, We are saddened. We are stunned. We are perplexed. What moved some misguided wretch to do this horrible deed may never be known to us. But we do know that such acts are commonly stimulated by forces of hatred and malevolence, such as today are eating their way into the bloodstream of American life. What a price we pay for this fanaticism. Vice President Johnson, suddenly elevated to the position he had sought for so long, asked if Warren would head the commission investigating Kennedy's murder. Warren politely declined, but the new president had extraordinary powers of persuasion. Johnson said, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, people uh, around the world are saying uh, that I arranged uh, for this assassination. There's only one person in the country uh, who has the uh, air of integrity and character about him, whose uh, investigation will be respected around the world. 
Chief Justice Warren said that he nonetheless turned him down. He said, and then Johnson said, now, Mr. Chief Justice, if I asked you to put on a uniform for your country, would you do that? Now, here was, uh, here was Warren in his, uh, in his 70s. And he said, well, well, of course, Mr. President. And he said, well, this is more important than putting on a uniform. And uh, Warren said to me, he said, that just got to me. And I agreed to serve on the commission. He told us that uh, our clients were the people of the United States of America and that we were Benny. proof about the clock was right, the buzzer up. Head of white hair, a ruddy face, spoke with authority, conviction, power, and uh, I listened to him. What is it about Earl Warren that made him different than other men? If he would walk into a room, he would be the dominant person in the room above everybody else. You just feel his strength. He had leadership. I don't know how you explain it. He just had the ability maybe because of his moral integrity, maybe because he believed in what he was doing. People would turn to Warren to get things done. Early on in the hearings, the chief had come over and there were a lot of newsmen around and they were pressing him as to what Marina Oswald was gonna to testify to. And instead of simply saying that he didn't know, he instead said there may be some things that won't be disclosed in our lifetimes. And that caused a tremendous furor and has been quoted repeatedly as evidence that the commission has kept back evidence from the American people. So many people say, aha, conspiracy, I get it. They didn't want anybody to know what really happened, how the bullet holes came in and this and that. And I promise you, that had nothing to do with it. He was a man, he had, I, I believe they had dinner with the Kennedys the night before Jack went to Dallas. Papa Warren was very fond of him and was very fond of Jackie. And when this tragedy took place, the thought in his mind that some tabloid out of England would be showing photographs and that Mrs. Kennedy would have to look at these photographs, that their children would have to see these and everything like that, was just beyond his comprehension. So it was no question in his mind. You just seal them up and nobody sees them for 50 years. There's not a hint of um, any type of conspiracy or, oh, the real truth will get out on that. But it's hard. People... Not understanding men of character like that is very hard for people to understand that today. To the White House in Washington comes the final verdict on the fateful tragedy which engulfed the nation 10 months ago. U.S. Chief Justice Earl Warren is the bearer... The Warren Commission report was detailed and lengthy, but its final conclusion, that assassin Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone, remains controversial to this day. In the decade that followed, fear of violent crime would sweep the nation, and the Warren Court would contribute to that fear by dramatically expanding the rights of criminal defendants in case after case. 1961, Mapp versus Ohio, illegally obtained evidence cannot be admitted in federal or state trials. 1963, Gideon versus Wainwright, a defendant accused of a crime must be appointed an attorney if he cannot afford one. 1964, Escobedo versus Illinois, the moment police begin to question a suspect, they must advise him of his right to an attorney. And when Warren announced the decision he wrote in 1966, Miranda versus Arizona, which instructed the police what to say to criminal defendants, he shook the world of law enforcement to its foundation. As one enraged critic put it, the Supreme Court has put yet another set of handcuffs on the police. A new phrase, the Miranda rights, became part of the popular vocabulary. Freeze! This is the police! You have a right to remain silent. You do not have to answer any of my questions. Anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and to have him with you when questioned. If, if you cannot, cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. If you do not you do have, not have a lawyer, you can remain silent. Do you understand this thoroughly? You are now under arrest. Warren, I believe, was a, a fierce opponent of police brutality and police practices 
that is behind his decision in miranda he is suspicious of deeply suspicious of and annoyed at the police he thinks the police will get away with stuff if they're not watched closely where does that insight come from it doesn't come from any liberal literature the new republic or something it comes from the fact that earl warren was there watching those police on the other side when he was a law enforcement officer. He knew what the police could do. He had maybe looked the other way sometimes when they'd done it. Warren was an aggressive law and order district attorney in the 1920s and 30s, with an intimate knowledge of police practices, good and bad. He knew what it took to get a conviction. Some say he went too far in enforcing the law, but his crusading zeal was irrepressible and impartial, as corrupt officials discovered to their dismay. He sent, as district attorney, all but one of an entire city council to state prison. He sent sheriffs to state prison. He sent uh, uh, chiefs of police to state prison. He went after the big fish always, and he didn't care where the chips lay. But Warren did care that defendants be treated fairly. To the surprise of the police and his fellow prosecutors, Warren established a public defender's office and told the public defender, If at any time, after looking at my files, you are convinced we have indicted an innocent man, we will drop the case. In his 13 years as district attorney, not one of Earl Warren's convictions was overturned. But in 1938, his strict code of fairness would be tested when Warren's own father was murdered. They had a man in Bakersfield, the police had caught him, that they were convinced, because he had confessed, that uh, he was the killer of, of, uh, of my grandfather. Warren, now state attorney general, rushed to Bakersfield and arrived at his father's house where the body had been found. When he got down there, he asked for the circumstances having to do with the confession and found out that it was something more than he felt was proper. Some third degree methods, maybe, uh, lack of uh, sleep or hammering for hours or something like that had occurred. As a consequence, he refused to even see the man, interviewed him, he said, cut him loose. And that was the end of it. The murder of Warren's father, Matthias, was never solved. Yet Warren remained committed to protecting defendants from aggressive police tactics that led to involuntary confessions. Warren's Miranda decision established specific rules for the police to follow. And in 1973, those rules were put to the test when Peter Riley was arrested for murdering his mother and interrogated for three days and three nights. In this particular case, when the first officers upon the scene, the first thing he did is turn around and vomited at what he saw. As experienced officers, they were struck by the fact that he showed no emotion. He wasn't crying, he wasn't upset, he wasn't pleading, he was just asking questions, you know, but my mother's dead, but could I have been the one? It was so matter-of-factly that they were disturbed by it. They believed, I, I think sincerely, that he had committed the murder. And they were trying to get the facts from him. And one of the techniques that is sometimes used is that you try to convince the person that you are talking to that you know more than you really know. The interrogators said, we know you killed your mother, and we can prove it. 
which was not true, but it is a trick trying to get the truth. There are two theories as to the events the night of September 28, 1973. Prosecutor John Bianchi based his case on a disputed confession signed by Peter Riley about 26 hours after the murder. Bianchi maintained for the trial that Peter Riley arrived home from a meeting at a local teen center that night, got into an argument with his mother, and in a rage, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, stabbing her in the hand, and then slashing her throat. After that, according to the case presented in court, Peter then broke both of his mother's legs, probably by jumping up and down on her, inflicted other knife wounds, and then washed off the knife and called for help. The defense at the trial is based mostly on the constitutional question of whether Peter's confession should be allowed to be heard by the jury. Well, through the, uh, the interrogation, I mean, there are numerous times when I keep saying I think I'm, you know, I don't know, really know what I'm saying here. I don't, it's just, you know, it's not true. It's like I'm making things up. When I saw the transcript of the questioning that the uh, state police had laid on him, it was uh, simply unbelievable. Yeah, I just wanted to cooperate and I, you know, I just wanted someone to tell me what exactly what was going on as well as, as you know, whatever it was they had to do next. I didn't know what they were going to do next, what they were going to tell me. I really don't, didn't know who to turn to. Unfortunately, this interrogation went on for such a period of time that Peter began to believe that they actually knew and could, and could prove that he killed his mother. But you see, they used Freudian psychology on him in the crudest way. They said, you have an unconscious mind, you see, and you're not aware of what's in your unconscious mind. And believe us, you did this, but you're not aware of it. If you confess that you did it, uh, it'll go all right with you. Don't worry about it. Just confess, and then you can go home. The central issue in the Riley case was a question of coerced confession, exactly what Earl Warren had feared when he wrote the Miranda decision. The very fact of custodial interrogation exacts a heavy toll on individual liberty and trades on the weakness of individuals. But Justice Byron White dissented. More than the human dignity of the accused is involved, he wrote. The human personality of others in the society must also be preserved. The Chief Justice explained. Interrogation still takes place in privacy. Privacy results in secrecy, and this in turn results in a gap in our knowledge as to what in fact goes on in the interrogation rooms. In order to combat these pressures, the accused must be apprised of his rights, and the exercise of those rights must be fully honored. In a separate dissent, Justice John Harlan wrote, the court is taking a real risk with society's welfare in imposing its new regime on the country. The social costs of crime are too great. But Warren concluded for the majority. Unless adequate protective devices are employed, no statement obtained from the defendant can truly be the product of his free choice. I figured a criminal needs a lawyer. I haven't done anything wrong. I, I, you know, we should be able to talk and I'll tell them what I did and, you know, what I didn't do and, and that'll be it and they'll send me home. And that is not the way it is. Convicted of manslaughter, Peter Riley was sent to prison. But a new lawyer, new evidence and a new trial established his innocence and four long years after his arrest, Peter Riley was once again a free man. The police station is where our liberties begin or end. And uh, the Riley case, I think, was the ultimate proof of that because the boy was absolutely innocent. And moreover, the proof of his innocence was in the briefcase of the prosecutor all the time. And we wouldn't have had that, excepting that he dropped dead on a golf course uh, during the appeal. And it was discovered that he knew all the time that uh, Peter was not where the prosecution said he had been on the night of the murder, and that the evidence was by another policeman. Uh, it's appalling, scary, but I don't know any defense against it excepting a legal defense. I feel very, very strongly that I am responsible for having this whole Peter Riley case. It's been on my conscience for 
13 years, 12 I guess now, I was the administrative head of the department. It was up to me to make certain that in any interrogation of a case such as this, that there be proper supervision. And that was not done. You, Richard Milhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Milhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. That you the national obsession with law and order became the platform on which the next president was elected. Richard Nixon had accused the Warren Court of weakening the police and strengthening the criminal forces in our society. He promised to appoint judges who would only interpret and not make the law. There was a feud between Nixon and, and Warren. That's putting it mildly. There was a deep and abiding mutual antagonism going back as far as the late 40s in California. This was a relationship among people who distrusted one another, who distrusted one another's motives, who regarded one another as political enemies. They never forgot one another and who took the opportunity to be aware of the other person and to pay the other person back if they could. That's putting it very strongly, but I think it's true. With people he, he didn't like or, or, or felt they were bad human beings, he wouldn't say very much, but he'd look at you with a, with a look of, of disdain. And I can, as I'm saying it to you, I can see it now. Wouldn't say anything, but you knew very well he didn't like them. Even when uh, Richard Nixon got in the White House and everything, you know, we were all saying, how can you talk to that man? How could you do this, you know? And he would always, he'd get very upset. He said, you must always have respect for the office. So help me God. No matter what the man is like, you have respect for the office. Before Nixon was elected, Warren had sent his letter of resignation to President Johnson. But Johnson's nominee to replace Warren had been rejected by the Senate. And Warren, realizing that Nixon would now appoint the new chief justice, was faced with a dilemma. Should he go back on his word and continue in office, or should he retire? Earl Warren chose to retire and to keep his word. He could have rescinded his retirement, but he didn't, so I wrote him a letter begging him not to retire. June 15, 1969. Dear Jeff, no doubt you are disappointed that I've not answered sooner your letter of a month ago. If so, I can understand. However, I've given much thought to it, and if any simple answers had occurred to me, I would have responded immediately. But there are no such answers. The reason I wrote him was because, as I said, I thought I knew everything there was. So then we were very radical, and we felt that Nixon would have a lock on the court for the next generation. You urge me not to retire, and I appreciate more than I can tell you the confidence you express in me. Such expressions are adequate satisfaction for the long public service. In August, it will be 52 years since I've had a day out of public service. Two-thirds of the people of the United States were not born 52 years ago. I believe it is time for me to retire. I really believe, Jeff, that what our country needs is the youth of America. Not to destroy what is, but to build. My hope is in the young people of today. I believe they can and that they will bring to bear the strength of their idealism to right the wrongs that regretfully have been done by former generations, and particularly my own. Affectionately, Grandpa. On June 23, 1969, Earl Warren retired. He was 78. A new Chief Justice, Warren Berger, took his place. The Earl Warren era of the Supreme Court had ended. He came out on his retirement, he held a press conference. How would you like the Warren Court to be remembered, somebody asked him. The People's Court. A one-line answer immediate, right on the spot, the People's Court. That's the way he thought of it. That's what he was doing. He was doing justice for people. His legacy will be that at some time, somewhere, there was a generation of men 
that stood for something beyond the expedient, that stood for something beyond just gain, that stood for a type of honor and integrity where a man's character really was determined by his refusal to lie. And you had to have character. Character was all that counted. Money didn't count. Um, race didn't count. Nothing counted. Uh, status didn't count. Um, often in the paper, it was character. And then those men used to strive only for character, and the rest sort of fell into line. Warren suffered three heart attacks in 1974. On July 2nd, he was admitted to Georgetown University Hospital. A week later, Pat Patterson came to visit. It was the best visit that I've ever had with Earl Warren. And uh, the whole time he was governor, I said, we had good visits and sat and talked. But tears came in our eyes because he said, uh, we've had a lot of good discussions. And at that particular time that we were talking all this, Mrs. Warren came in and asked us, did we need anything to drink or anything to talk, coffee, anything? And he, he told he said, no, we're just having a good time. We're thinking about what we're going to do when I get out of this bed. We were the last one to visit. He told me this on his bed, he says, all the problems, all the legal problems, all the legislative problems. And he said, well, it was a good life, wasn't it? The kind of person that Earl Warren was, you didn't deify, you didn't think of him as perfect, you thought of him as cordial. You thought of him as bright, you thought of him as committed to the better parts of American life. You saw him at a baseball game. You knew that he was a fan of this and that. You knew that he was a person who was a real live American human being. You knew that he had children and he had a wife and he had made mistakes that were wrong perhaps, but whatever else you knew about him, you knew he was a good American. And in that sense, you knew that he was for the rights of every citizen. Voting rights, rights of the accused, racial equality, freedom of speech. For Earl Warren, there was no question. These rights are guaranteed by the Constitution and are truly the legacy of all Americans. He's not chief justice of this court. He's chief justice of the United States. That's his title. And that's what he actually is. And he must have a great big heart and a great big mind. And Warren had both. And I know of nobody that can equal it. Join President and Mrs. Bush for In Performance at the White House, Wednesday night at 8. Coming up next, it's Blue Skies on Silver Screen. brother Tracy who had grown up with Trent.